Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about PERS antibody. A lot of this stuff is not going to be new. Uh, it's kind of like one of these uh, duh yeah. Uh, we've known that for years type uh, uh, talks. But I think some of the uh, uh, latter stuff that we're currently doing uh, in our lab uh, may be of interest. And so I just want to kind of give an overview of how my lab perceives PERS. And I guess I've kind of come to the stage of my career, at least my life, in which I realized there's going to be no magic bullet, especially in the short term. And so what we recognize is that PERS takes away about 10 percent, uh, at least 10 percent of our production. And so I think my new philosophy is now, well, how do we get that 10 percent back? And in doing so, um, my lab works on more of an integrated approach. And it's, and it's an approach which is not only integrated, but it also has to be collaborative. And first of all, my lab still does a lot of the traditional work in vaccines, diagnostics. We will continue to make progress uh, in those areas. Uh, but now we're seeing, a renewed we're seeing a renewed interest, really, I think, in nutrition, uh, the effect of PERS on uh, growth and feed efficiency. And later on, you're going to hear a talk by Tom uh, Burke. And so I, I promised I'd put him on the spot uh, because he's going to help us provide uh, one of the solutions to PERS. And then finally, there's a lot of effort in my lab working with uh, Iowa State and uh, ARS on can we have uh, genetic improvements. And I think classically we always thought in terms of resistance, we want a resistant pig. But in reality now we're looking at such things as tolerance, a pig that becomes infect infected but it really doesn't care. But now it's moved into this area of resiliency. In other words, a pig which may get sick but doesn't lose its ability to grow. And, uh, and then finally, uh, can we make this a vaccine-ready pig? And then probably at the end of the day, we're going to be making a, a transgenic pig uh, that lacks the uh, PERS receptor. And uh, again, PERS, from my perspective, or at least how we study it in my lab, is a population disease. This is some of the work that we're doing in the, post -genet uh, the PERS Host Genetics Consortium in which we infect 200 pigs. And these are just the weights of 200 pigs over 42 days after infection. And these black bars are the normal non-infected pigs. And you can see that one of the effects of PERS is that this population structure in terms of weight just falls apart. And then we also know other properties of PERS. It's stealthy. The virus is stealthy. The virus is easily transmitted. transmitted and it interacts with other pathogens. Uh, and we call these uh, polymicrobial infections. And then we also see it as a uh, persistent uh, disease. We see it persistent within a, a production system. And a lot of work that we've done, uh, experimentally infected pigs, we can also see persistence uh, at the lev level of a small population of uh, 200 uh, experimentally uh, infected pigs. And so this is a, a picture that everybody has seen before. Uh, the interaction of PERS with the immune system. Early on, we see a lot, a lot of the innate uh, responses suppressed. Uh, we do make antibody. We make lots of it. However, neutralizing antibody appears later. Uh, viremia is relatively prolonged and uh, can uh, resume uh, in the pig. Uh, some of the properties, uh, factors related uh, to these immunological properties are the fact that PERS has a very complex service, surface uh, covered by glycosylated proteins. Uh, the other feature is that a lot of the antibodies generated during uh, infection are not necessarily generated to surface proteins, but are generated to such things as the nucleocapsid. Now this is, is, used to be one of the idealized uh, structures or, or models showing the interaction of PERS with its receptors. And in terms of receptor, we've kind of helped resolve uh, some of these issues. And uh, some of the work we just published on uh, pigs that are transgenic and lack the CD169 or Cial adhesin receptor, we find that those pigs can support virus replication quite nicely. They don't express CD169 or Cial adhesin on macrophages, but still express uh, CD163. So now I think we have a clearer model of how PERS infects a cell and also uh, infects a pig. Uh, 
uh, the virus, uh, many of these structural proteins have multiple epitopes. If you just look through the literature and you look at everything related to a PERS epitope, you can find lots of them. Uh, those purple asterisks are all epitopes that have been proposed to have some role in neutralization. But even when you look at those regions, those epitope regions, and in this example, GP2, you can find that within those ep epitope regions there is sequence variability as well as sequence hypervariability. And so one thing we need to keep in mind is that this virus continues to evolve uh, with the emergence of uh, porcine high fever disease, the lenotype strains in Europe, and then uh, finally uh, the, the uh, co-isolation of uh, PERS uh, in Ebola in the uh, Philippines in 2008. Uh, PERS vaccines, we've heard a lot about them today. Uh, modified live vaccine was first introduced in 94. The MLV, I think, has been demonstrated to improve profitability, especially when you have uh, PERS. However, there have been some limitations, uh, one being incomplete protection, and the other thing that we've heard a lot today, especially from uh, Roger Main, is that we lack a, a serological uh, diva uh, for existing modified lives. Uh, killed vaccines are considered not to be effective. And so as an alternative is this uh, concept of acclimation in which you purposely infect pigs uh, with farm-specific uh, strains. Okay, now in terms of antibody response and some of the challenges that, that uh, relate to vaccine, again, we have these N-linked glycosylation of, of glycoproteins. Uh, I didn't say much about it, but uh, there's been a lot of reports in the literature of decoy epitopes. We have these variable and hypervariable epitopes. Uh, the response is directed away from surface proteins towards such proteins as a nucleocapsid. Uh, Antibody-dependent enhancement has been reported in the past. And one thing that is kind of nonspecific is the effect that uh, PERS may have on uh, B cell uh, repertoire uh, development. But we do recognize that neutralizing antibody is important. And this really goes back to the probably the seminal study done in 2002 uh, by Fernando Osorio, who showed that passive antibody can protect in a reproductive model. And, uh, and under these circumstances, we, would, we might say that this is sterilizing immunity. And work that we have done as part of the post, uh, PERS host genetics consortium, uh, we find a definite inverse correlation uh, between virus load and uh, neutralizing antibody titer. The higher the, higher the neutralizing antibody level, uh, the less virus. Okay, so in, in general, I think this is a statement that's been said quite a bit. Uh, PERS neutralizing response is weak and delayed. Neutralizing activity is primarily directed against the homologous virus. And so we took advantage of the genetics consortium sample set to ask a couple of questions. And within this large population of pigs that we study, are there pigs that produce a strong and broadly neutralizing antibody response? And then what are the epitopes involved in broadly neutralizing antibody? And then does the broadly neutralizing antibody response have an inherited component? In other words, is this a property of the virus used for infection or is there actually genes uh, that regulate uh, the response? And really this goes to, uh, back to uh, uh, some of the original work done on HIV patients who produce a very small percentage of them are protected from HIV and they produce this broadly neutralizing response. And it's characterized by the ability to recognize conserved epitopes and the capacity to neutralize uh, several uh, HIV isolates. However, out of this literature has come some general, uh, uh, some, uh, some uh, general ideas regarding why don't we see broadly neutralizing epitopes because they are often blocked from recognition. Uh, such things as glycan shielding. Oftentimes, these uh, uh, neutralizing epitopes are flanked by hypervariable regions. In other words, mutations in those hypervariable regions just slightly twist or slightly contort the epitope so that it is no longer uh, recognized. And so, uh, in our uh, studies, we perform a typical virus neutralization assay. Uh, this is just a modification of the assay developed by um, Eric Nelson in South Dakota back in the early 90s. Uh, 
Uh, we just do one to two uh, dilutions of serum against a constant uh, concentration of virus, in this case 200 TCID50. We incubate them and we use CPE as the endpoint. Uh, but we also, for each of these assays, for each 96 volt plate, we include a couple of uh, controls, one an internal control, and then we also back titrate the virus to make sure uh, that we have added the right amount. Uh, one thing I want you to uh, point to is uh, abstract 28, uh, in which uh, we report, especially for doing experimental work, a simplified serum neutralizing assay involving GFP tag viruses. It's a semi-quantitative assay that only involves a single nutrition, not, uh, a single uh, dilution, in which case we no longer have to perform serial titrations. Uh, in our studies, uh, when we do these neutralization assays, uh, we start with uh, four viruses that are different from each other. Uh, in the OR5, this is just the typical OR5 phylogenetic tree. Uh, we, choo we choose viruses that are on different branches. Uh, in this case, the four viruses that we use in our assays are uh, something P129, uh, BR2332, something we call a KSO6, and then uh, NVSL. And so the source of samples that we use in these assays are from the host genetics consortium. And the model that we use is we start with 200 pigs, typically two to three weeks of age. We infect them with the experimental PERS isolate. And then uh, at uh, 42 days, uh, we terminate the study. And then just to kind of give you an overview of some of the work that's been done in the PHGC, I think uh, uh, Andrew Hess, Abstract uh, 38, uh, has some good information. So when we do these uh, assays and we just look at homologous neutralization against the virus used for infection, uh, what you can find is that uh, you find a difference. You can still find after 42 days pigs that don't produce any detectable antibody, whereas you find a very small subpopulation of pigs that produce very high levels of homologous neutralizing activity. And this is done with NVSL. Now, he, this is another virus that we call KSO6, and it's a very different distribution. After 42 days, actually, a lot of the uh, pigs produce no detectable uh, neutralizing activity, uh, but still, there's still a, a small uh, number that produce uh, very high levels. Now, when we look at the heterologous response, in other words, response against uh, uh, different viruses, uh, this is what we find. We still find uh, viruses that recognize none of them. Uh, we can find, uh, uh, we can, I mean, sera that recognize none of the viruses. Uh, we can find sera that only re uh, recognizes one virus. Uh, and then sera that may recognize two or three uh, of the four viruses. And then finally, again, we see a very small population in which they recognize or neutralize uh, all, four, uh, uh, all four isolates. And so based on this and other studies, and we've exp since expanded that to do neutralization against 10 type 2 isolates as well as a single type 1. And so based on this, we're able to take antibody and actually develop some distinct classifications. One we call group one, no neutralizing activity. Group two, only homologous activity. Group three, we call heterologous. And by heterologous, we mean it can, it can neutralize several type two viruses, but cannot neutralize type one. And then in terms of broad antibody or broadly neutralizing antibody, we kind of make the general statement that it neutralizes all, or at least all the viruses that I have in my freezer. Uh, type uh, 2 viruses as well as a type 1. So again, this is just for the purpose of classification, uh, but, it's, uh, uh, but I think it's relevant. Uh, one interesting thing is that when we look at these pigs that develop broadly neutralizing antibody versus homologous, we see a di different picture in terms of viremia. Uh, homologous, high levels of homologous uh, antibody, we typically see a very sharp peak that comes down. Broadly neutralizing producing animals, the um, peak or virus replication is much more prolonged. And there is an immunological explanation for this, and the idea is that the immune system is exposed to virus for a much longer period of time. Uh, this gives an, uh, an opportunity for um, uh, somatic uh, mutation in B cells and affinity maturation to actually to select uh, for B cells uh, that are going to recognize uh, more 
uh, antigens uh, on the virus. And this, uh, uh, these properties have been uh, modeled and, uh, and some of it is presented in uh, abstract uh, 39. So one thing we wanted to do is, is we wanted to kind of look at the relevance of these neutralizing antibodies. And so we developed a system uh, to uh, select for resistance. And the idea is can we make uh, um, viruses resistant to neutralizing antibody and then go in and sequence those viruses, find where the differences are, and then use reverse genetics to see if those really are uh, escape mutants. And the whole idea here is to begin to identify what epitopes are being recognized by these different classes of antibodies. And this is the system we use. We start with the bulk package, a bulk, bulk passage of virus on a T25. Uh, we put it on a 24 well plate and we do, we dilute virus versus diluting antibody. Uh, and then uh, after uh, four days we stain it and we find the edge of where uh, neutralization occurs. And so we take the last wells that have any, any virus and then we passage them and you continue this and then eventually you find uh, that there's no longer neutralizing activity. Now the anisera or the persera that we chose for this, we chose based on a modification of our standard study that includes vaccination of pigs prior to challenge and then terminate the, the animals at 42 days after challenge or 70 days after vaccination. Out of this is we found three pigs that had some very interesting uh, neutralizing activity. The first pig is, is homologous. It's homologous to the extent that the titer is one, is one to a thousand. That's a huge amount of neutralizing activity that you uh, uh, rarely find, if any, in PERS. But you can see that all the activity is homologous because when you react it with all the other viruses, there's no detectable activity. And then finally, we have a broadly neutralizing uh, antibody. What's interesting is that against the homologous virus, the neutralizing titer is relatively low, but it's broad, uh, being able to neutralize all available viruses, including a type 1. So we use these two viruses in our selection process, and uh, these are the results. So we could take our homologous antibody, and this is the uh, resistant virus, and sure enough, it's resistant to antibody, but it still maintains susceptibility to broadly neutralizing antibody. That doesn't change. And then if we do the second experiment, do the same experiment with our neutralizing, with our broadly neutralizing uh, sera, we can show that we can lose activity. In other words, these become resistant to neutralizing, uh, uh, broadly neutralizing antibody. But when we use a homologous uh, uh, situation, uh, they still maintain that ability to be neutralized by homologous uh, serum. And when we look at this broadly neutralizing uh, neg negativity, I guess you'd call it, is that it's not only uh, resistant or, or you lose neutralizing activity using uh, uh, antibody from the parent strain, but if you use any strain from which we've identified broadly neutralizing antibody, uh, those uh, viruses still are persistent. And so one of the things we've done is we've gone to sequence these to ask, ask the question, where have the changes occurred? Sequencing is still in process. This is some of the preliminary we data, data we have. Oddly enough, and unexpectedly for me anyway, a lot of these mutations appear in uh, GP5 and M. And if this is an idealized version of GP5, on the N-terminal end, and this just shows the ectodomain region, on the N-terminal end, there's a hypervariable region one. And then right here at the stock, there's a second very short hypervariable region called hypervariable region two. Uh, in this region, you find uh, epitope A, which is the so-called decoy, decoy epitope. And then here are the two glycans with a conserved region. And then in the middle, you have a, a disulfide bond with M. And so the results so far, so far show that those escape mutants that escape from homologous neutralizing antibody are mutations down here in the second hypervariable region. Whereas those that escape this broadly neutralizing response, they're in M, oddly enough, which is part, which has always been thought that M and GP5 form a larger uh, conformational epitope. And so some of the summary and conclusion, uh, neutralizing antibody participates in the control and clearance of PERS. Uh, 
there's a wide variation in the NAB response of pigs. And the neutralizing antibody can be divided into st distinct groupings or classifications. Um, the overall response is related to the virus. In other words, the pattern or the amount of homologous antibody that's produced in the population is re really related to the virus. Enhanced could be related to a, a vaccine. Uh, different classifications of, of neutralizing antibody, homologous versus broad, recognize different epitopes. Okay, that much we've demonstrated. But I think what you have to do is that this observation has to be put into context of the sera that we use to do the work. The sera that we use to do the work represent the absolute extremes that you can find in a population. This is not your typical pig uh, that's responding uh, to a virus. So even though we're working under these extreme conditions, I think uh, the uh, results are, are, are interesting, especially when we can begin to understand the nature of this broadly neutralizing antibody uh, the, the questions for, for all fields in virology is that how will they participate in the uh, next generation of vaccines. Now in terms of tools, other tools in the lab that we are using to look at the role of uh, B cells and T cells during PERS infection is uh, in, in, uh, in collaboration with uh, Iowa State. Uh, we have a skid pig uh, that lacks B and T cells. And so, um, and uh, Catherine Ewan, uh, Abstract 35, will uh, kind of uh, shows a little bit about this model, especially uh, uh, during infection of PERS. And then uh, in future studies, and, uh, especially funded by the National Pork Board, we're going to reconstitute these animals and then begin to ask the question, what constitutes uh, protection? Mm -hmm.